There was once a world in which all of the creatures suffered from an illness, but only so long as they took its symptoms seriously. And not doing so ranged from being improbable to outright impossible. One man determined that he did not want to live on any world he was born on. Easier said than done, notwithstanding the fact that hardly anyone even ever says it. Tonight's bonus question. If all of your thoughts were shipwrecked and stranded alone on a desert island, who would they then talk to? And if you think about this enough to even consider responding thereto, it remains extremely unlikely that you'll ever have such an experience. Okay, super bonus query. Where, but in activities such as this, is the missing of a calamity seen as a calamity? <laughs> While riding a train, you can imagine that you're looking out a window and taking shots at objects you pass. Or in the alternative, believe that you're sitting still while objects outside your window go past, taking shots at you. Which of the two approaches you employ depends on the particular metaphysical and psychic orientation preeminent within you. That is, on how stupid you are. <laughs> the train's going past the scenery, and the scenery's going past the train. Your brain's running through your thoughts, and your thoughts are running through your brain. How much clearer can it be that life is alive, and alive all over? How else could it be? One man used to catch his thoughts standing between him and himself, and sometimes he'd think to yell out, down in front, if indeed that is my real front. Only a surveyor with firmly planted consciousness knows exactly where he is. How foolish are those interested in the occult idea of psychic space travel when man is already a creature naturally able to be in two places at the same time. <laughs> and now for tonight's magical question. What happens when you put a mirror in front of another mirror? What will the first one see and realize about itself? Since individual men do not know what they're about, they conceived of religion and psychology so that they had professionally and collectively not know. <laughs> A nutrition update. If the brain was not directly dependent on what comes from the stomach, man's thoughts could be otherwise. You do know by now that this is not the sort of news to be passed around to children, the elderly, or anyone else. <laughs> and now from our sports desk, the latest scores. Man seven, his thoughts seven plus. Just as yesterday it was man six, his thoughts six plus, and the day before that, man five, and his thoughts five plus. I assume you catch the pattern and understand that you should keep this to yourself. <laughs> The true use in struggling to be a warrior is in the effort to stay eternally alert. There was once a man who had a pet dog and a pet cat, and to improve the nature of the dog, he needed, the dog needed to be watched at all times, so the man gave the cat the job of watching the dog, even though he was in charge of both of them. <laughs> if two words, or just one hand gesture, can't explain the truth about life, then, well... I just don't know what to say. <laughs> a king looked out upon his empire and thought, a million people out there with a million stories, everyone the same. <laughs> when one man heard of other people giving nicknames to aspects of themselves, like their nose, their stomach, their sex organs, he decided to do likewise with his thoughts and name them ether and formaldehyde. <laughs> Uh, in one mythological land, shortly after it was visited by the good Johnny Appleseed, spreading health, beauty, and happiness, it was tried through by Johnny's antithesis, the evil Fred, the glue salesman. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
the ordinary dream of heaven and the ordinary dream of hell, but who the hell ever notices where they are now? <laughs> there was once a man who thought that his shorts had gotten all up in a bundle. Turned out to just be his thoughts. <laughs> Predictable. The ordinary, in their interest in studying injured men's total loss of memory, Missed the point by not turning their attention to the matter of quite ordinary men's continual moment-to-moment -moment loss thereof. Men conceived of the notion of vacations from a dim awareness of how their minds worked. Fernabout's tear play. Regardless of what the philosophers, the psychologists, and the religious theoreticians say, Thinking good is not the secret. Feeling good is. And who can teach that? And this session's Nobel Prize in Comprehension goes to the mortal mass choir as they joyfully sing, We don't get it because we don't have to get it. <laughs> um. There is, inescapably so, one thing that can never be described to a creature in a closed loop which is, you guessed it, the nature of a closed loop. A situation which no amount of crying, let me out of here, will modify. Some literary news. The reason that the mind likes books is not because they can impart knowledge or entertain, but rather because they have a recognizable beginning and a definite end. There was once a man who attempted to put his thoughts between two book covers and turn them into an intellectual tome, but through some miscalculation it came out instead as a bucket of lard. <laughs> well, as all embarrassed but unrepentant drawing tables would say, back to the old drawing table. <laughs> Evidence that those with a distorted view of man are unlikely to ever do better is the fact that they never ask themselves, if life gets sick, to whom can it turn? While standing on his front porch one day, a man saw a tiger speeding by in a car, so he shot him. Damn wild animals got no business driving civilized machinery, he said, then went back inside, turned himself inside out, all without noticing it, of course. <laughs> the reason that routine history is so unreliable and useless is that each day swallows all days that have gone before, but never fully digests them. To be enlightened is to have extreme digestion. <laughs> On some worlds, they do not embalm the dead, if they look serious enough already. <laughs> the unwritten law of would-be leaders and advice givers. When you don't know what to do next, talk about yourself. And all would-be followers and submissive wimps will always listen. And thus you'll both get off the hook and onto the road to happiness and personal satisfaction. <laughs> One man said privately to himself, if thoughts had teeth, guess what I would tell mine to bite? <clears throat> Let's get one thing straight now before you get it too crooked. To comment on the lack of thought's present significance is not to say that they had none in the past, nor that they might in the future. News of extreme chronology. Only a stably conscious man's watch gives the correct instant time. A man asked a mystic, is one who has seen the truth about life more conscious or just conscious then in a way different from everyone else? The sick always look curiously at the well. Likewise, the weak at the, stu at the strong and also the stupid at the, well, <laughs> they must look at something. 
Only the mind forgets, never the body. And when you then reflect on how things tend to go in a man's everyday life, you're face to face with the powerful influence the former has over the latter. More questions regarding man's behavior can be answered through considerations of his dual citizenship than ever dreamt of by psychology. One man would, as often as he could remember to do so, call his home and ask if he was there. Of all mortal dangers, the, gravest, the greatest to the few is in being dragged along semi-consciously behind the thoughts running through a man's mind. Someone in the tour group said, if this is Thursday, then this must be Belgium, which instantly shocked a man nearby momentarily out of his slumber. My God, again, I've taken these thoughts to be me, leaving me stranded in a land with no name. Tonight's extreme health news. As long as you believe you can be treated, you can't be cured. And... As long as you believe you can be cured, you can't be treated. Which I'd call extremely fair news. <laughs> One man dearly looked forward to 5 o'clock on Friday afternoon since that was the end of the official work week and he felt like nothing further bad could happen to him until Monday till his thoughts finally said, don't you wish. <laughs> Man's physical senses are for the purpose of the body receiving needed information from the external world. His mind is for the purpose of receiving, of receiving from external sources, well, well, it must be for some purpose. <laughs> As he turned a corner in a totally new and unexpected manner, a man ran face to face, right into life. And trying to regain some of his normal equilibrium, sputtered out something to the effect of, so sorry, beg pardon. <laughs> to which Laugh replied, okay, but don't let it happen again. In reaction to which the man thought, happen again? Hell, I don't understand how it happened this time. And Laugh said, I heard that. Mm -hmm. If Laugh hadn't turned out to be such a big old fuzzy teddy bear... Men wouldn't have never had to dream up ideas of demons and such. <laughs> there was once a mystical school whose slogan was, if you can't go on a journey, then go figure. And after you do that, come back and we'll talk some more about the possibility of travel. Survival tip. A mind with a motto has nothing to fear in a blizzard. <laughs> And yet another astounding, outstanding attribute of thought. Thoughts are this reality's only lapdog in whose lap his master sits. <laughs> A viewer writes, sometimes I think you pick on thoughts too much. I could be wrong, but this is what I think. Yours, etc. There is fair play and compassion in this universe normally unnoticed as regards the strong not picking on the weak and unarmed. I think particularly of the fact that the body never attacks the mind. Another visitor's tip. You see, around this here part of the universe, anything a man's mind can think of can possibly be. Except for one Tinksy winksy little bitty thing. Really of no significance. Since one man didn't have a TV to watch, he had no show to write letters to. And on al alternative days, he had no letters to write to anyone, so he had no TV shows to watch. You see, boils and girls, it's like I keep on a telling you. It all works out. I swear to smothered sheep heads, it all friggin' works out. And with boisterous glee, the little nippers bolted from the classroom, scurrying off in all directions in search of their own individual place in this here universe. Ah, but they'll soon enough grow into manhood and forget about such foolishness. <laughs> Except for mystics. Those with goals that are visible have none worthy of a man. 
There was once a man who could readily make up maxims and proverbs. And for every positive and inspiring one he could create, he could instantly come up with a parallel negative one. He continued along in this activity until one day, bam, it hit him. These weren't contrasting axioms he was producing, but rather a continual reinforcement of the two sides of his brain. Men conceived of studying the human body in great detail after they first took a quick look at the mind and decided, to hell with that. I mean, after all, it is an intellectual function that knows its own limits. It is an, it is an intelligent function that knows its own limits. Whew. Men began dreaming of traveling to other planets soon after they realized that most of them would never be going anywhere. I refer you back to the fact that any reasonably intelligent operation realizes that it is like what is likely possible for it and what is not, excluding mystics. And lastly, from our audience comes this letter. As a conscientious, and if I might be permitted to humbly say so, reasonably intelligent viewer, I not infrequently have a difficult time telling whether you are referring to mysticism in a positive, positive or negative sense. And having a deep, serious personal interest in the subject, I find it, to no small degree, disturbing and most confusing. And would appreciate your definitively clarifying the matter once and for all, sincerely. And someone here, using my name, replied to the writer, you stupid slut. <laughs> An obviously undeserved outburst for which I can only offer my most sincere apology. I want to point out another commonly available, readily observable, probably already known to you, fact or two, occurrence in life that is, that shows again how drastically removed ordinary thought is from the truth about life. And I do this not to be discouraging, not to be critical of man, but on the basis that if you truly are wired up, if you're born wanting to travel, if you're born wanting to change positions, you have got to have an objective, clear knowledge of everyone's general location in the overall scheme of things mentally. Or else all your ideas about moving, being more conscious, more awake, or enlightenment, all of that is just avocational bullshit. Because you can dream forever about, well, I will end up in a spiritual or intellectual paradise. But if you do not know where you are now, then all of your dreams, all of your desires are intrinsically flawed. And tonight... Uh, to use an example, we'll bypass, we'll leave religion. I mean, but considering the totality of man's intellectual structures, that is civilization of which religion is but one aspect, though oft times by ordinary men, proclaimed to be the crowning achievement, or at least the most inclusive example of intellectual achievement and civilization, it is but one aspect. And so rather than continue to use it of equal stature, if you can see it, for those not interested in religion, let's take just the overall arts. And I was thinking in particular, not just the arts, I was thinking of literature and et cetera. Uh, there is a fairly common term bandied about now by intellectuals and commentators and social observers if not people of more specific educational or professional backgrounds I hear it's referred to as the journey of discovery and 
and similar ideas voiced thousands of years ago. But the journey of discovery seems to be, I'm just using without any critical, certainly no sarcastic tent to it, I'm just recounting right now a general view of quite ordinary man. And oftentimes the, the voices expressing such ideas are beyond, speaking in the routine sense, are beyond just ordinary men. It may be what, who are considered to be outstanding intellectual, artistic voices of their time, whenever it was. But this journey of discovery goes something like this, and it touches, uh, let's use the example of like romantic love. <coughs> you can take it literally. <laughs> that was an accident, just coincidence. <laughs> just crude coincidence, as, pe as Professor Jungy would say. <laughs> you know, if he could still talk. <coughs> Perhaps he didn't clear his throat often enough. Never heard of it being <laughs> fatal, but who knows. <laughs> now, assume it, now I think about it, it probably has something to do with the relationship between the need to clear your throat and the size of your brain to start with. So I'll leave it to you from there to consider which way it might go in any individual case you'd care, care to consider. <laughs> All right. <laughs> At any rate, I was thinking of... Uh, Romantic love, which is a historically common example, even from the literal into what just the ordinary would consider to be the possible metaphorical connotations of such lyricism, poetry, songs, fables, fiction. At any rate, the uh, journey of discovery, and I could have used other areas. I could have used art, science, all sorts of things, but you'll catch it in a minute. The journey of discovery uh, is used not in, when it's being used at its fullest, and we're still talking about just at the ordinary level. I'm not uh, attributing to those speaking to be anywhere out of the ordinary, but they attribute to it more than just the literal. The journey of discovery goes something like this, the way it's historically been used. And they're referring to the mind. But they will tie it to, to go back to the example that we might as well start with, of romantic love, that, use it from the masculine sense, that a man sees a woman walk by for the first time and is smitten somewhat, is attracted. But then must undergo a undertake a journey of discovery. And in literature, it would normally be he begins to rhapsodize, or he could begin to sing. He could begin to, uh, what it all amounts to is to think. If it was a, if it was an opera, if it was set in an opera or a Broadway show, or if it was set in a, say a medieval setting, he would perhaps, the, this man would fall into poetic rhapsody. That here goes, maiden X, this unknown maiden, passes his window. Ah, and perhaps even he asks someone, they says, uh, that's Princess Felicia. He said, Felicia, Felicia, or Juliet. And he will again, what they describe as, very often as a journey of discovery, that he has to begin to and they will never say think. They never use these words. But they will say, he then must, he begins to reflect on, he begins to sing, he begins to muse within his own soul over this fleeting, instant, nascent attraction he had that she went by and just some little something went, ah, you know, who was that? And if somebody says, oh, that's Felicia or Juliet. He goes, Juliet, Juliet. And then if it was done under a performance situation, then our Romeo or whoever he is might begin to pace back and forth and begin to, you know, ah, such a sight I've never seen. And she's already walked out, so she's already gone past his window. And he begins this journey of discovery. Ah, such a face I've never seen. Such blonde or red hair. Such a figure. Such a countenance. And he goes on and on. And he breaks into song. Or as I said, he supposes it's improvisational, poetry on the moment, and he, 
here's what it amounts to this journey of discovery it's he has to think about her until it builds up into the fruition of real love did I make that clear enough all of literature all parts of the world are replete with these for thousands of years up until today it is seen by those, of course, I understand this sort of thing is not as popular amongst humanity in general as soccer. But it is popular enough for me to use, and at least most people are, were exposed to it, even if by quasi-forceful means in undergraduate school, that this is a very common theme. As I said, uh, don't make me... One point should be enough, but it's not simply romantic love. It could have been a religious conversion. It could be someone, a heathen from some view, who first heard the message of Christianity or of Islam. And he just heard a few words, or perhaps Jesus just walked by, or Muhammad just walked by, or Buddha just walked by, and he went, what is that? Or maybe he just heard Buddha go, blessed are those who can find their car keys without fail. <laughs> and he goes, what is that? And he's gone, and he asks, ask, somebody says, well, that's Buddha. They could go through the same thing. <laughs> or somebody could hear about the scientific method. If we were going to set the uh, milieu back, let us say, into the early dark ages. That some man is out and believing that we should burn the old woman down the street who's unmarried because our crops failed. And someone finally says, I've heard a new idea that says that it's not old maids who uh, have warts on their nose that cause our crops to fail. And you go... Forsooth, what sayest thou? How could it be? And they go, well, there's this thing called a scientific method that said it has something to do with the weather. You know, the rain and stuff like that. And you go, hey, you're jiving me. And they go, no. And you go, the scientific method. And you could start the same thing. You could do that over you know, Buddhism or Juliet, you say. You understand. The point is that something, that things can come into a man's life that have a potential of, we might say, almost life-changing uh, weight. Like, if it did indeed turn out to be the classic case of a Romeo happens to finally find his Juliet. Or as the Greeks would have it, that the mist, that one male part, a female part, suddenly is struck that there goes perhaps, even before he realize it, his missing part, that which is the basis of all human endeavor, is to find your missing part so you can be a complete whole. It could have been that, or it could have been somebody hearing the first time about Islam, hearing the first time about the scientific method. What they're saying now, the reason that they include this part, the, the reason I brought it up was the, the, dis, the journey of discovery, is that just being exposed to it is not the, the deed is not done. That even though, if we knew in advance, or we've already been clued in, we can just tell the way that it was set up, that when this guy comes out, and he's staying there, and this girl walks by, and he goes, and she just walks off, nothing said, and he pulls it, he said, who the hell was that? And he goes, that was Princess Juliet. Ah, well, you already know. If we were in just a standard non-avant-garde theater, we were not off in a village somewhere, you would, you know that that, there's the plot, you already know it. That it's going to be a love story between him and this girl that just walked by. But they see it as a journey of discovery. That just, just because the potential happened, that's not the end of it in a man's life. That he must then undertake some journey of discovery to bring the possibility of this life-changing occurrence, to bring it to full fruition, he must undergo a personal journey of discovery. And they can do all of this, and they can, uh. what are they saying? It's quite simple. They're saying that he's got to think about it. <laughs> that's all they're saying. That, is, that certainly would not support even a English Lit 101 course with someone who had no interest in teaching it. That would not hold up a play for which there was no admission. You can't just say, well, Romeo met Juliet, 
the first first couple of times he met her, I mean, it didn't seem a big deal. He thought, you know, she was a pretty nice looking bitch. But then later he went, ah, rah, 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 and he mumbled and he kept talking about her and he questioned other people about her and he'd hear about her and he'd hear things. And he'd say, well, what? And he'd think, rah, 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 rah. All right, we could be talking about Christianity. Somebody hears about a religion. They go, oh, you know, what a bunch of crap. And they keep hearing about it and they go, well, tell me a little bit more. And they taught this road of personal or this journey of personal discovery that in some way a man must take the possible, the available information and he must internalize it. He must in some way manipulate it, massage it, chew on it, look at it from different angles, take it into his personal being. And only then, only then through this personal journey of discovery might an important, nay, nay even life-changing occurrence be possible. That all sounds, I mean, that's just the way life works. It's got to sound that flowery, that complex. But all it is, is that all they're saying, it's not my word, all you got to do is be able to look at all, have anything resembling eyesight of the intellect. All they're saying is that he had to think about it. You are thus left, or need I point out the obvious, if Romeo did see Juliet pass by, if that is his missing half, there is not one frigging thought necessary. We are talking about sex. Thought has nothing, nothing, can you spell nothing, to do with it. But, again, if I got to point out the obvious from a viewer's point of view, from an outsider, from an audience's point of view, if you pay your money and you sit your ass down in the seat and the curtain goes up and there stands Romeo and this guy and Juliet walks by and he goes, good God almighty. And he jumps her and the curtain goes down and they all come out and bow like, you know, thank you. I would just assume that the three actors involved would at least not be all that surprised if they do come and meet out and take a bow and are not handed large garlands of roses. <laughs> but from a quite real, not an opinionated view, from a quite real view, a man or a woman, but a man smitten sexually, if a woman walks by and the sexual attraction is there, anything said, anything thought after that point is absolutely irrelevant. It gives a whole new glorious definition to the word moot or irrelevant or superfluous. But in, now back to the way it, it strikes quite educated, sophisticated people in life, oftentimes uh, attributing to such people more than just sophistication and education, metaphysical insight that they are able to realize that in every situation of any real significance in the human drama, in the human experience, the participants must in some way take a personal journey of discovery. Here's what's happening. Thought is being given contemporaneous credit for after the fact activities. Those of you with real good sight or memory, at least no one now theoretically, that it cannot be otherwise. I just picked out an example. It covers all of man's mental activity. If it were not thus, for one thing, one thing that it would drastically change is that then my question of what are you going to say next could be answered. This is not the reason, but after all this time, for those of you who have been able to actually put it in your mouth and chew on it enough without <coughs> joining the good doctor in his below ground nap, <clears throat> that could clear it out of your throat or even swallow parts of it. One of the ways to look at why, or 
One of the ways to look at the dynamics of the fact that you do not know what you're going to say next, and yet it does not seem to have any effect on the affairs of man. One of them is that everything you do say, which is simply a reflection of thought, a manifestation of thought, is everything that you do say, even when it apparently is a contemporaneous comment, is always an after-the-fact activity. Back to the example. The man can pace the floor. He can write. There can be a Dante writing thousands of semi-interesting pages. <laughs> I shouldn't say that because he speaks so highly of all of us. Of course, they didn't make him study us in school, did he? I can see it now, little <laughs> yellow and black little cheap book that says Cliff Notes on Us. Because <laughs> I was thinking, how close some of us get to the edge thereof. <laughs> the journey of discovery, whatever a man says, and it may appear to be, and may be accepted by Humanity as being of true, metaphorical, spiritual, philosophical <coughs> import. But there is nothing that the mind or, the, or man can normally comment on. There's nothing that a man can say that is the instigator of that upon which he comments, or that about which he comments. That anything that Dante can spend, th thousands of pages, Romeo could have spent uh, hours on the stage as you sit there and watched him. It could have kept your interest. It could have been, it would have to be, of course, subplots as they call it. That he would have had to, his Juliet go by him finally through the voyage of discovery, the journey of discovery, come to the conclusion that yes, that is for whom I was meant. So then he must approach her, well, the good old Hollywood version of it. Boy meets girl, boy loses girl, boy gets girl back, the end. Run them out, bring in the next crew, next show time, 5.15. And so, he would have to decide, yes I do, that is, for whom the gods intended me, that is. The keeper of my heart, my soul. But then something must happen. She got to get sick, Somebody with no sensibilities whatsoever, some guy named Bubba, got to come along, start mucking about in his business, trying to hit on her. You know how it goes. Get the mortgage to her farm, and then Romeo's got to overcome it. But all of this, no matter how inspiring, no matter how above the normal course of things it may seem to be, such as uh, a Dante chasing not only what appears to be a physical love perhaps, or what could be his love, but it turns into a metaphorical discovery, journey of the spirit, as he's attempting to pursue her. As I said, the stories are everywhere. Not that people understand, but the stories are everywhere. And e but even when it apparently, that the commentary, which is what all of, say, Dante is, is what all of Pilgrim's Progress is, is what my little version I just made up of Romeo and Juliet, that is boy sees girl and then talks himself into to the, vo the journey of discovery, unfails within himself, discovers within himself that yes, the more I reflect on this, the more I see that this is what my life was intended for. Whether he's talking about love, a philosophical effort, a pursuit of the truth, it's all, you've got to be able to, as I'm sure, you can't if you listen to this at all, you got to to put up with it. It's to be able to think metaphorically along any kind of line you want to. But no matter what it is, what it apparently has to do with religion, the scientific method, romantic love, physical love, sex, any comment made, no matter how metaphorical, no matter how potentially spiritual, allegorical it may be, they are given the mind, they're giving the actor, the writer, they're giving the mind contemporaneous credit that is, that Romeo, or a man, he hears about Christianity several times, or Judaism, whatever, and instead of romantic love, let's go to, I said it would leave Christianity, or religion, but I want you to understand that I'm simply not, 
this is simply not tied to the physical life of man. But a, a man then, a Romeo, could pace a stage and undergo a, undertake a journey of discovery internally, not doing to, having to do with love, but having to do with a spiritual enlightenment. And so he hears about Buddhism. And at first it just sounds like, well, oh, that's just crazy. I got no interest. I, it may be enough, the same way as Juliet went by, you might go, what's this stuff about Buddhism? So somebody tells him. So he goes, ah. Oh. He hears a few lines about it, and then he paces the stage for hours. Or there's some sort of little subplots. And he, in fact, continues to, through monologues, through dialogues, he continues to reflect upon Buddhism instead of Juliet. He begins to sing the praises of the philosophical ideas of Sufism or Zen or whatever it is. And he, goes, and he begins to talk aloud. Ah, the idea of union back with God and realizing that God does not represent just a physical entity, but perhaps the core of the truth, our origins, perhaps this search is a going back through the genetic history of man. So he goes on and on for several hours or thousands of pages to make the book or the play worthwhile. And then, apparently, through this journey of discovery, becomes convicted, becomes convinced either that, yes, Juliet is for whom, the one for whom the gods intended me, or it could be, yes, now I see it, a spiritual life, a life in Buddhism or Christianity, whatever, is indeed my last work. This is what I was fated for. But it took three hours. It took 2,000 pages. And of course, when those who analyze it in this manner try and apply it to real life, they would say that certainly is not limited to the literal number of pages in a tome or the hours spent on a stage, that it might be in real life a man's lifetime to discover such. What are they talking about? I ask you again. This void to discover is the guy is thinking about a spiritual quest. He is thinking about Juliet. He is thinking about perhaps there's something to the scientific method rather than burning old people that we don't like to make the crops grow better. Whatever it is, it's as though they keep talking about this journey of discovery. You mean think about it? Well, yeah, but it's much more than that. Such as, well, it's like a, you know, it's, you know, it's like a, I mean, it's not just thinking about it. It's like internally, I mean, in your soul, in your spirit. and But it's not just thinking about it. Oh, no, 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 no. You're missing the whole point. Well, you know, I'm listening. Well, it's like this. Well, you know how Dante, when, uh, uh, wait, don't give me an example. I, I, I'm just trying to understand first. What do you mean that's not thinking about it? Well, all right. All they are representing is they're saying that a man can be struck by the potential of something, by hearing it, by seeing it, but it is not necessarily within itself capable of its own fulfillment, of its own unfolding, that a Juliet, that the truth, that a spiritual life, whatever it is, that this one thing may not be able to come out. It may not be possible that a Juliet, even though she may be the one for whom the gods intended Romeo, Romeo she cannot simply come out and go, ha, 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 here I am. That if a man was indeed fated, fated to be a Zen monk, a seeker of the mystical truth, it's just, it does not happen this way, so, so they say, so life makes men say, that one day a man, even if he's been searching for it, reading about it, that he is trampling through some of the lower steeps in northeast India, or northwest India, whatever you like, and suddenly he walks around a mountain, and there is the great mystical truth going. <laughs> no, they say, as life makes them say, no, that's not the way it is. Now, the potential may be there, but a man has got to undergo his own personal inner journey of discovery. Pardon me, can I ask again? You mean he's got to think about it. You're missing the point. You're missing the point, say they. Yeah, I know. Assuming that you see, I'll leave it to you, if you find some exception to that, which you won't, but go ahead if you don't have anything else to do. You can, you can call it anything you want to and then keep playing the two parts I did. You can, if you want to wrestle with it and go, you can think that I, wait a minute, that you find an example or an exception to that. 
Go ahead and write through your little food grinder, or your thing, <laughs> your juicer. <laughs> and then ask yourself, play the two parts I did, then say, all right, so that's not just thinking about it. And then you take to the physician. I mean, you see me do it. You can do it. And then go, well, no, no, no. And tell yourself why that is not simply thinking about it. That is all it is. But here it is, to remind you of where I may leave it for the night, what, what is happening and is never noticed. But now understand, we're not making fun of this. This is a part and parcel of not only the collective civilization, the collective intellectual life of man, the singular life of man, the only, the only aspect of man that distinguishes him from the other creatures on this planet. At its best, you know, we're not being sarcastic. If you had your choice, if you're out in ordinary life, if you're stuck in the city, if you're taking a short nap, there is no doubt, well, I'll go ahead and say it, that it would be more enjoyable for a man with any intellectual wherewithal to read the inferno than it would to be the National Enquirer. It simply would be. That does not mean that one of them offers anything of transcendental substance. But, they would still say that just the reading of it will not do it, that you're missing it. There has to be a personal journey of discovery into whatever it is. And you're left with asking. You mean thinking about it. No, no, no. No, you might first you know, think about a few things, but that's not the... Why do you think we make up, says civilization through man? Why do you think we have concocted? That doesn't sound right, does it? Why we have composed... <laughs> authored such a term as personal journey of discovery. If we just said, wanted to say think about it, we'd have went, think about it. Yeah. It's much more than that, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. At what appears to be even the highest level, one more time to remind you, this is not for any sake of irony or sarcasm or criticism, because with ordinary people throughout the world, and if it was not Dante or Shakespeare on some other part of the world, you know they have their own variety of it. Oftentimes, uh, in any particular area, considered to be their religious canons. But at any rate, it is literature of some kind. It's the written word, or used to oral traditions, but it'll be a written history endemic to those people, or to some large, anyway, to some locale, that offers not just stories, but stories that lend themselves immediately to potential metaphorical interpretations. That, if they're describing even a Don Quixote, they're describing the, the question, quest for the grail, that it's not just a physical, religious, that it represents an internal, even though it could have been a real one, they would say, even though that there could have been knights out actually searching for the vital fluid of life itself, or for a, you know, a cup that held the blood of the gods, that, that may, they may have actually undertaken it, but, they would say, for a man with any above average intellect, insight, human compassion, human understanding, he would see it also, even though it could be, in fact, it could be symbolic, we should say, instead of metaphorical, that it could have actually been a journey that they took, or that came to fruition or not, but it also would be that if a knight was out searching for some relic of the gods or something that Jesus or Buddha touched that he, they thought had some baka, some intrinsic now power just due to its proximity, due to its handling by some semi-divine figure, but it would also, while a knight or a warrior or an adventurer was out on such an expedition, that he would also, if he was doing it at the height of its potential, that internally he would also be undergoing a what? A journey of discovery. That while searching for the grail, out in the ordinary world, about the best they can come up with, usually is, that even while searching for the grail, a true, a true potential knight would finally realize somewhere, oh, wait a minute, finding the actual chalice that held the God's blood is not it. What I've been searching for was the chalice that held the blood of a new me. And so somewhere along the way, he would realize this other search is actually meaningless. And they would probably stop it because they would discover that the grail was their own enlightenment, that sort of thing. All right, given that, again, I repeat that, that with most people, there's no doubt that is much more nourishing uh, than reading 
you know, whatever, some war story, the news, just pulp fiction. But it's still, if that is a journey of discovery, it still is only pointing out that the people involved thought about that which had already happened. They are giving the mind credit, mm -hmm. contemporaneous credit. Mm -hmm. Back to if it makes it easier or more complicated, who cares? Romeo paces the stage for three hours, more or less, talking to himself, doing what appears to be extemporaneous rhapsody, rhapsodizing about Juliet. And he continues to talk about her, her looks, her eyes, her features, what he hears about her charitable nature, what he's heard about her good deeds. And you see a man there for a period of three hours, in a sense, talk himself into loving Juliet. Or talk himself into loving the spiritual life. And it appears to be somewhere toward the end of the drama, some sort of moment of epiphany that after all this talk, all this pacing, all this dreaming of Juliet, recounting everything he's heard, recounting everything he imagined she might be. And of course, there had to be you know, music and some changes to hold your attention three hours or 3,000 3, pages. But it finally comes right toward the end and it goes, I see it. There's no longer any doubt. The gods, the gods have smiled. It is she. She for whom I have, of whom I have dreamed and sang and imagined for the last three hours, 3,000 pages, 40 years. It is she for whom I was destined. And it feels satisfying. People buy it and they will enjoy it. Even common people at the literal level as just a piece of drama or a piece of fiction. Or as I said, out at the city level, it, it means nothing, but relatively speaking, there are those who will take it or who will claim that it has a metaphorical possibility. But what are they saying that this journey of discovery, what brought Romeo within three hours after first seeing Juliet, what brought him into loving her, according to them, this journey of discovery? For three hours, he thought about her. Again, I won't do it, but they will. Oh, no. You know, you, you crude Philistine, you, don't, you know nothing about drama, especially metaphorical drama. And they'd tell me, which I just did, so save your effort. That's not the half of it. That's not the problem, though. If there is a problem, that's not what I'm pointing out. That would be enough, but that's not it. Even though they will deny that it is as simple a matter as that the journey of discovery is a man thinking about whatever the subject is. They will deny that, which should be enough, which is not, obviously. That, when I say should be enough, is to make some, to make men go, my God, I never thought about that, which it doesn't. But beyond that is this. Even if, even if I didn't say, all right, all it amounts to is thinking about it. Follow this right quick. If I let him go with, here was a journey of discovery. It took him three hours, 30 years, 3,000 pages. But he finally, through this inner voyage, this inner journey of him contemplating, meditating, reflecting upon, weighing the possibilities, did decide that the spiritual life was for him, or that Juliet is his fated. And I don't say anything about think, I just let that go. I go, okay. It's still, they can call it, well, his, his soul opened up to the true beauty, to the fated love of Juliet and all that. But what it amounted to, this journey of discovery, was something internally went on. If, if I don't bring out thinking, and I let that go, they go, yeah, it was this internal journey. Whatever it was, was something happened internally to him? Yes. Of course, they can't do this, but surely you people know this. If the man or woman was truly, if that was his fated, all it amounts to is she is sexually his type. And we'll assume vice versa, but at least she was his type. She walked by and he wanted to screw her. <laughs> this three hours, these 3,000 pages of metaphorical, <laughs> allegorical, musing, reflecting, this inner journey of discovery that in some way he wrestles with possibilities. He wrestles with his background. Nowadays, well, all times. That somewhere of him pacing the stage would come out, I'm sure. I mean, they've got to fill up three hours or you've got to fill up 30 years. <laughs> Uh, sometime it'd come out that, that Romeo would go, why am I resisting? Why am I resisting? Why her beauty? She seems so soft and lovely, and I hear that she does such good works. Why do I resist? 
Why do I even hesitate at all? Ah, methinks I recall when my mother began to beat me and would take away my cornbread and give it to my sister. <laughs> and I, you understand, it would have to be him trying to wait. Well, what is it holding me back? Why can I not get there? And he has to break through. He has to break through some of the unconscious traumas of his earlier days. <laughs> We are talking about with civilization, literature, <laughs> romantic love, uh, spiritual voyages, the spiritual life. We are talking about the secondary life of man. This is not the primary level of existence. It is not bio survival necessary. You can live without it. It, it is secondary to man and man's life. Sex is primary. Sex is primary. It's one of the two or three. It's just absolutely Necessary for humanity in general, if not an individual. So if Juliet went by, and that was his Juliet, it's not just one, that's a nice story with the Greeks. Well, I'll be that as it may. That was his Juliet, or one of the potential Juliets. Went by. Anything said after that? Did you say anything? <laughs> Read the president's lips. Anything. Anything said about that? It may be entertaining. It might be interesting. It is superfluous. There is no voyage of discovery at the primary level. People do not sit around hungry. I'm talking about, I'm talking about hungry. Physically hungry. People do not sit around or stand up and begin to compose a book or recite. People do not begin to reflect philosophically on hunger. Huh, should I eat? Should I actually eat? Is there something deeper to the aspect? You know that's not true if the person's sane. If they're hungry, they'll eat. If they're horny and can get hold of something, they'll have sex with it. If they're sleepy, if they're very tired, a man does not go sleep. Ah, uh, sleep. Huh, huh. There is no voyage to discover. There's nothing to discover. I'm sleepy. I'm hungry. The rest of it is giving to the mind contemporaneous credit, which it does, is the only reason that men will not face or cannot face the fact that they do not know what they're going to say next. Because it has no vitality either before or after what's going on. It is given, which, and so the only thing that's left is what appears to be now. And you ask a person, did you mean what you said? And they go, just now? You go, yeah, just now. And they go, sure I did. Of course, you can't push it any further. You know what will happen if you say, well, when did you plan to say that? Yeah. Oh, you know, you're crazy. All you can do is to give the mind, which is the same thing as speech, all you can do is give it contemporaneous credit. They're right this second. But there is no such thing because thought and speech are not primary manifestations of man's life. And so anything they do, and I'm saying do, they manifest themselves. Anything they do and given contemporaneous credit for are after the fact activities. If at the end of three hours or 3,000 pages, Romeo goes, I've decided, there's no doubt, I love her. All right, if that be true, he loved her the second he saw her, what they call love, at the very second. To give the mind, to give this voyage of discovery, to give it credence, to give it at that moment when he goes, I see it now. My life is to be devoted to the religious quest. Or my life is to be devoted to fair Juliet. That appears to be the moment. He is given credit then. You feel relieved. You close the book or you applaud. It all seems right. If indeed something happened, it happened long before this. As soon as Juliet went by, he was smit. When you're sexually smit, your organs can't talk. Your stomach can't talk other than... Mm. I was going to get into the other area, or another great one, wherein men are can attribute to each other wisdom on the basis of them reflecting. It's somewhere, usually in the 30s or 40s, they begin to reflect philosophically on their life. <laughs> but thankfully we ran out of time. Because <laughs> I know there are many people who might hear this who will not care for it and find it interesting or entertaining at all. And to you people, I would say what that correspondent here wrote to another viewer under my name, but never mind.